What's up guys, it's Brad from Light Architect. Today I have a few quick tips regarding what I like to call modeling for destruction. As you probably know, I recently created this interesting house destruction project in Blender utilizing rigid bodies and organized constraint systems with chaos. While personally it's one of my favorite projects regarding the constraint and rigid body setup, I think it's important to acknowledge that one of the reasons this simulation looked as nice as it did is due to the way the house asset was created. When building your assets for destruction, there are a few guidelines that I recommend you follow in order to get your simulation both to look amazing and avoid glitches in the process. The first thing I recommend you do is make sure your asset is scaled correctly or even slightly larger to its real world counterpart. Blender's grid dimensions are metric measurements at default, meaning each square is one meter in length. You can use this knowledge to model your asset accordingly and at least get roughly close to the real world measurements. By doing this you are allowing the rigid body physics in Blender to work as they are intended, and therefore you are creating a more realistic and reliable simulation environment. In addition to this, in my experience I've noticed that when a rigid body is very small, random glitches can occur. Because of this, one of the first things I do when I get a wonky physics error is simply scale up the scene slightly to see if the glitch can be resolved simply. The second and likely most obvious concept to apply when modeling for destruction is using image references to understand what internal pieces of an asset you need to model. When creating an asset for destruction you not only have to think about how an asset looks from the outside but you also need to think about the internal elements of the real world object that could be revealed when it is destroyed in certain ways. In addition to this when creating constraints for destruction it actually helps to have these internal elements to sort of glue things together to emulate how they would be supporting the object if it were in the real world. In the case of this house destruction project I looked at pictures of incomplete houses that were being constructed as well as architectural diagrams on what a cross section of a basic house looked like and used them as references to my modeling process. I then modeled each piece and constructed the house asset from the ground up from the internal structure to the final exterior. I first created the internal wood beam structure, then added the larger plywood planks and siding, added some roof tiles with an applied array modifier, and then finally finished by adding some windows, a door, and a simple front porch for a complete asset. For a long time I was trying to destroy standard assets simply by fracturing their geometry, but without the internal details there's only so much you can do to get a realistic result. This brings me to my third piece of advice. When creating these different elements for your model, the most important rule to follow so that you can simulate correctly and without glitches is to make sure that no vertices or faces intersect with each other. This includes both the topology of the specific geometry in each separate internal element as well as the overall structure of the asset. It's not noticeable in the final render, but if we zoom in close to this house model you can see that there are small spaces between every element to ensure that the simulation works properly even before the fracturing process. In order for Blender to calculate the interaction of rigid bodies correctly, the mathematical representation of each modeled asset should allow for interaction between them. And if geometry is intersecting, Blender can get confused with the simulation. Finally, most of the time when you destroy objects in 3D, you are likely going to go through some kind of fracturing process. One last thing to keep in mind if you plan on fracturing your geometry and you've already gone through the texturing process is that the more subdivisions your object has before you fracture it, the more likely the UV mapping of that texture will transfer over accurately to your fractured version. In the case of creating this house asset, a lot of the elements were created with just basic primitive objects, so I simply added some subdivisions to them once I was ready to fracture and everything turned out just fine. Anyways guys, that's it for this video, I hope it was helpful. I'll be releasing the full advanced tutorial on how to destroy this house utilizing chaos very soon, so stay tuned if you're interested. As always, feel free to leave a comment if you have any questions or suggestions in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.